Well, I have a joint question um, for Christian, and it's something I've been studying over the past few months. I've been studying a lot of Prio's statistical analysis, along with that of Uppsala and the Human Security Index globally, uh, in the ways that battle deaths are defined, weapons, injuries are analyzed, and whether a state is in conflict or not defined. Looking at their origins and you know rummaging around for sexist origins. Um, and one, one question I have is you did an excellent study, in fact I use it in my paper, on how rape became a tactic and weapon of war. You know, how one of, one of the kinds of rapes, the non-op. So we're on the same wavelength, what rape is being used as a weapon. But if rape is a, a tactic or a weapon, and they're both illegal, so they, they fall under the same categories of law. If rape is a weapon, then how are weapons injuries anal analyzed and weapons deaths? Um, all the databases that I've found in the world um, don't count rape as a weapon, and therefore when they look at the number of battle deaths of civilians or combatants, they don't count women raped to death. Now, I know that all the, vi all the rape sexual violence you're talking about is survivors. What about women raped to death in battle that defines an armed conflict? So why is battle death and sexual violence put kind of opposed? How many, how many battle deaths are from rape? That's my number one question. And number two, um, if rape is a weapon, when you analyze in battle weapons injuries, you look at intensity and health impact of weapons. Right now, by not treating sexual violence as a weapon, you don't get whether when you have a stick put up you, there's more fistulas than when you have forced intercourse, when you have sexual slavery, when they use a gun in the vagina. All those kinds of injuries from this weapon are not detailed by the ICRC and PREA and Uppsala and the Human Security Index. Um, whereas rape is one of the most frequent injuries from a weapon in war today, and it's not treated like a weapon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just asked, should we take a couple of questions, well, from a couple of people and sure. then go ahead? Yeah, okay. Um, hi, my name is Betsy Kawamura, and um, I'm part of WILF Norway, and also creating a network for survivors of sexual violence to educate them on 1325, etc. I think thanks to the panel discussion, it's so nice to see more men in a room like this once in a while. <laughs> but my question was that, um, you know, in terms of studying the different um, initiatives and in Resolution 1325 that was spoken earlier today, I think one of the, the basic problems with the UN Security Council itself is that although the resolutions were passed unanimously, if you look at it concretely, it seems to be rather depressing. You know, look at Sri Lanka, you know, situation in Syria and situation in um, Libya. You know, I mean, theoretically, the resolution was passed unanimously, but when you try to put it into action, you've got the veto powers. So you have the situation in Sri Lanka right now where, you know, um, the, the president Rajapaksa doesn't want any kind of investigation. You have a situation in Syria where China and Russia basically veto the situation. You have a situation also which I'm studying is like the, the fate of defectors coming out of North Korea. And both China and Russia do not want this to be investigated. So in your opinions, what can potentially be done to the problem of the UN Security Council structure itself that works against the resolutions that they create? Was my question. Thank you. So this question was for all and anyone in the panel, I assume. Yeah? Okay, I have three more questions, but I think we'll take some answers now and then go on because these are some questions that might hmm. give some long answers. Christian, I'll, I'll tackle the first one, if you can leave the re second one to you. Um, the questions you ask about the figures are really important questions, and uh, you are you are right in the assumptions you are basing it on. We are, in this statistics, reporting exclusively battle deaths. People killed in direct battle. No, no, I'm going back to that. I heard your question. Um, there are several reasons for that. The main reason is really a rather trivial one. And that is that we have looked into various types of violence in, in conflicts. And 
the only type of violence we think we are able, based on the material currently available, to, to um, report so that it is re comparable with a certain level of reliability. I don't want to exaggerate this because there are problems even with those data are really battle deaths. We would very much want to report other types of deaths caused by war, indirect deaths. You know, for that matter, the deaths caused by uh, challenges to maternal health. More, more women die giving birth in war than they otherwise would do because of absence of health services, because of nutritional issues. There could be a number of reasons. So, you know, the range of, of types of deaths that you would want to count is, is virtually limitless. Uh, but for us doing statistics, it's important to have a definition whereby we can count deaths with some level of comparability across conflicts. There are a number of, conflict, of, of, of problems with that. Counting, uh, counting uh, deaths by rape is an important issue, not only in the way you phrase your question, but it's also in fact very important in relation to the underreporting that I touched upon earlier. Because it's very, very likely that in most conflict, uh, those who die as a cause uh, caused by rape are virtually absent from the statistics. That's, that's, that's a big challenge. Uh, and of course we're working on it. And I'd say to, to my, my fellow presenters here that some of the things we hear, not at least the things we hear from Mushahidi, once you have that type of a reporting, which is both real-time and geographically defined, uh, and actually gives the account of the victim, then you can actually contribute to some of the types of figures that are currently missing in our studies. Again, we would want that to be consistent across countries. But you can very well imagine, based on the type of re reporting that Ushahidi provides, for example, uh, a case study, an individual country where significant documentation of this sort has been done over a sustained period of time, which could give us very, very interesting insights, which by no means we can draw from our current type of statistics. A battle death is somebody who is killed directly in battle. So it basically excludes civilians. So no civilians are counted in So no civilians are counted in battle deaths that might compose to what or what what is not an armed conflict. There's a separate category for civilians who are killed indirectly or directly as a result of battles. Battle deaths are combatants. Hmm. Are you going to go on? I'm going to try and answer the very difficult question you asked about the UN, and I'm going to give you a somewhat of a simplistic answer, but I think it's one that, you know, that we often overlook, is that the UN is composed of member states, and that the UN is only as strong as its ability to build consensus amongst member states. So, you know, the issues that you, the examples that you gave with Sri Lanka, with Libya, with Syria, I mean, really... As long as the UN is not going to be able to have consensus, the UN is not going to be able to, um, to act. And, you know, I have sympathy with people who are critical of the UN. My own organization is very critical of the UN from time to time. But I do think that we need to be really clear that they are composed of member states and that essentially the institutions of the UN, such as the Secretary General's Office or the Human Rights Council, are entirely dependent on their ability, which is extremely limited from time to time to pull everybody together. So, and I think the dichotomy between the General Assembly and the Security Council is particularly important because the Security Council really is where power is concentrated and you have your five member states and they are motivated by concerns beyond human rights, civilian deaths, etc. Um, and you know, as long as they have a power of veto, it is going to be what it is. So we know that with regard to Syria, that China and Russia feel very strongly that when they um, backed the Libya resolution, they felt that the US, the UK and France really used that as cover for regime change. They, one of their guiding principles is respect for sovereignty. So they're not going to do anything in Syria for as long as they feel that they can't guarantee that this is not just another... Um, you know, this is just not another attempt by the West to, to effect regime change by another name. And, you know, I have some sympathy for that approach. I mean, there is clear evidence that NATO exceeded its mandate. 
So, you know, that, that is the inherent weakness of, of the Security Council structure. Now, there are efforts and there's a discussion about reforming the Security Council, but again, that is going to require the five permanent members to give up their power. And to be honest, I don't see that happening. So the UN is only ever going to be as strong as its weakest link. And, you know, its weakest link is that you have the member states that are guided by geopolitical interests, by sovereignty interests, and that tends often to override concerns of R2P2 and also human rights. So, Thank you so much. We have some more questions here. That's what you he's first. And then... <laughs> Yeah, my question, my question is to both uh, Amnesty International and the Human Rights Watch. And uh, I am a student. My name is Isa. I have a feeling that uh, we in the West would like to hear what we we would like to be told. So um, my feeling is that uh, maybe what we uh, our government uh, is like sometimes supporting the rebels and sometimes supporting the state. So since both of them are doing these atrocities, um, how do your organization verify that the information collected is not, is, uh, is not biased? And the other question is, uh, how can your organization change such perspective that we have? We have a perspective that we like to be told what you want to hear. Maybe if you go to the field, you see different issues that's going on there. Thank you. Take some more questions before we answer. Um, I think it was the gentleman over here. Uh, my questions may raise uh, some uh, misunderstandings. Um, Due to maybe I have not been able to follow the speeches, uh, or uh, yeah, I have I have not been able to understand them uh, fairly. But what uh, I could hear from nine o'clock in the morning up to today, up to now, it's Africa, and uh, in Africa, it's. Uh, talk about the very poor countries uh, where uh, governments uh, do not exist or uh, are very, or if there are any governments, they are very weak. Uh, in such uh, societies, uh, the harassment of the female women uh, or female, it's, uh, it's astonishing, it's not a good thing, but what we what is happening in the developed societies and peaceful societies, there is also a female harassment, uh, what I could understand of my living in Europe. The other question is that uh, there is a feeling uh, among the, I belong to Pakistan, apparently, uh, basically, and uh, we in Pakistan, which Pakistan has been made a poor country now, uh, there's a feeling that such organizations that like uh, Human Watch or a Ministry and uh, others, these are used to depress or suppress the governments there in those countries. Uh, I have examples, I will not go in the details, but uh, what is your opinion? about that, uh, what are, uh, after what your experience. The, the other thing is that uh, in my uh, neighborhood, uh, it's an area which has been occupied by a nation uh, which claimed to be a, uh, a mini superpower. And we haven't talked about those people who have been occupied and uh, uh, people are being harassed there also. Hi, um, I'm Susanna Sirkin with uh, Physicians for Human Rights. I'm based in the United States. And I just have um, two sort of comments slash questions about um, 
some of the, ch uh, the challenges and needs of using science and medical research to um, document sexual violence that, that still um, um, are before us. And in particular, um, in the aftermath of the first conviction at the International Criminal Court, where um, many organizations um, were disappointed that um, the charges of, of sexual violence were not included in the final judgment and in the decisions. Um, it's my understanding, after quite a lot of discussion over the years with uh, people at that court, that indeed we still do have many, many hurdles um, to um, overcome in terms of getting the kind of solid evidence that's going to be needed both at the international level and in countries where like, we've been working recently in the DRC, for example. And um, there are two areas, I think, where additional documentation could really um, be deepened and it will require more investment and, and greater will on the part of both um, local organizations and international bodies. And that is, on the one end, the field epidemiology, survey research that is required to get better prevalence um, numbers of um, both, um, you know, how widespread and systematic um, rape and other forms of sexual violence are in conflicts. And that requires actually field researchers on the ground gathering the data. And there's no real substitute in effect for that if you really want to get a good prevalence number. And then on the complete other end, the challenges of getting actual medical documentation. And we've seen how deeply difficult this is for many of the reasons that, Liesl, um, you pointed out. Um, and, and at the same time, we need that kind of evidence for charges at um, courts to, to actually stick. And um, so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about how this will evolve, including, for example, the technologies that we now use in the developing world for prosecution of rape, DNA, and so forth. Um, that standard is going to be so hard to meet. And when we go and work in places like the DRC and even Kenya, um, there are judges now who say, or, and, and police, no DNA, the women didn't come in 72 hours, there's no prosecution possible. I, I, we believe that's not true, but I'd love your thoughts about how to deepen the ability to gather documentation at both the population and, and the individual uh, level. Okay, uh, let's start answering. Do you want to go first, Liesl, on the question for both of us? Yes. <laughs> and then I'll say first. I agree afterwards. <laughs> um, Issa, I think it's an interesting question that you ask, and that's a criticism that I think that both Amnesty and Human Rights Watch face from time to time, that we're biased in some way. So let me answer it in a number of ways. The first is to say that Human Rights Watch sees itself as being an independent organization, and we see that our strength lies in that, because, as, you know, the minute that a government, and, and I say government because largely our advocacy targets are governments, the minute a government thinks we are not independent, that we have biased evidence, it really undermines our own ability to be effective advocates and to press for change. So we do guard our independence very jealously, and therefore, for example, we don't take any funding from governments at all, and we don't take any money from any corporations that in any way would create a conflict of interest for us. So we have an extremely complex vetting process for all the funding that we get to ensure that there's no possibility that funding is being used to influence um, our work. The second thing we do is that we give the researchers, you know, and this is really the meat and the heart of Human Rights Watch, are the people on the ground who are collecting the information, who are doing the investigations. We give them a huge amount of autonomy to identify the issues that they, as experts, as people who live in the region, often as people who have invested a great deal of their professional life in particular issues or countries, we give them a lot of autonomy to guide the organization on what the issues are that we should investigate and what the advocacy should be. We also don't have... Um, you know, we, we concentrate our efforts across the world. So we don't, for example, only do research in Africa or only do research in the developing world. We have a whole program that focuses on the US. We have uh, researchers that are based in Europe. We have 
you know, we, we try as much as possible to work across the world, and we cover about 80 countries, some better than others, obviously. We obviously are currently putting far more resources into Afghanistan than we are into France. But we do try very hard to be independent and objective, and we do that in a number of ways because, as I said to you, it doesn't help us if a government sees us as not impartial because then they just don't take us seriously. Um, if I can just add a little bit to that, I think 95% of that is, is true for Amnesty as well. There might be some nuances that I missed. Um, but also if you look at the evidence, and, and since you brought up the government and the opposition, if you look at the reporting from both Human Rights mm -hmm. Watch and Amnesty on Libya, for instance, you will see that we have reported on violations both by mm -hmm. the former government, Gaddafi, the opposition, while it was an opposition, and the, the opposition that is now in some sort of control of the country. So I think you will find a relatively consistent uh, standard that we set on everybody. <clears throat> as far as uh, reporting on, on Africa and, and c countries in the South, uh, I think it's also true to say of both organizations that we, it, it often, when, when we, when, when I personally as a representative of Amnesty is criticized by this. I, I, the criticism comes from all areas, which I then feel I must be doing something right, because the Israelis say that we are overemphasizing in Israel, the Pakistanis say we're overemphasizing in Pakistan, the, you know, the US says, why are you criticizing us when the Chinese are much worse? Uh, the, the Chinese say, why are you criticizing us when they're doing the same thing in the US? When that happens, I feel I must be doing something right, or the organization must be doing something right. Um, having said that, of course, um, there is, to be quite sort of honest and open about it, there are more human rights violations, I think, in numbers in Pakistan than in Norway. So there, there will often be more reporting on Pakistan than Norway. And we have to be honest about that. Having said that, though, since we are talking about what we are talking about, the best figure you can get for rape in Norway is somewhere between 8,000 and 16,000 a year, which is, I mean, that's not even a figure, it's ridiculous. How can you, how can you calibrate anything with such an uncertain figure? So one of the demands that we have put with all the other NGOs working in this field in Norway on the government is we need to know much more about violence against women and rape specifically uh, in Norway as well. So this is not something we only bring out in conflict countries or poor countries or third world or whatever bracket so you would like to put countries in. This is certainly a battle we have brought straight to our own doorstep because we know it is a problem of a, a human rights violation and violence that happens here right now. I would also like to, yeah. to mention one thing. Well, you've got I've got a mic, so I'm good. Um, <laughs> There's actually a uh, sex trafficking uh, deployment of CrowdMap that I did not mention, I should have, um, didn't think about it, uh, in Tennessee, um, in the United States. So what that's doing is it's exposing the fact that sex trafficking, which is violence against women, uh, is happening in the United States, which people don't, most people in the United States would uh, have no idea that anything like that is happening there. So there are projects um, that utilize, I mean, our tools to highlight these issues in uh, the global north, I guess. So yeah, that's just one example. And there was a specific question for you, I believe? Yeah, um, Suzanne, I think you're completely right. I mean, I think that, that there are real challenges for us in building up the cases, and I think with the ICC, they have been very good at charging of including sexual violence in warrants and indictments, what they haven't been good at has been investigating this. My personal view is that there's an overemphasis on, on DNA evidence and science, and I personally think that we need to go back to good old-fashioned investigation. So I think one of the things we need to do is we need to have much better training for investigators to just physically document evidence, is to say, I interviewed this person, they had bruises on their face, they had, you know, the kind of stuff that we were doing before we had DNA evidence. Um, so I think that a lot of the concern about not having sufficient evidence is sort of a misplaced sense that, you know, I think too many of us watch Law and & Order and, 
various other programs coming from particularly the US about sort of what kind of evidence is possible. And I think that really as human rights investigators, we need to get better. Um, and I think we need to learn from what Physicians for Human Rights have done, is just doing the old-fashioned investigation rather than sort of trying to figure out whether you can take DNA in a place like the DRC, which clearly you can't. Well, very good questions. And I think what cuts across these three questions, as well as the two previous ones, is uh, uh, a call for more solid empirical documentation. And it's clear that we need that. And in one way, my presentation illustrates that very clearly, where the best we're able to say is something about the magnitude in very, very rough terms. Now, I'd probably disagree slightly with you, Jun Peder. You say it's a ridiculous figure that Norway reports when it says between eight and 16,000 rapes a year. Well, perhaps the figure is ridiculous, but that way of reporting it is not ridiculous because that is an honest way of reporting the uncertainty that there is about the figures. And I'd actually applaud that way of reporting. I'd much rather have that than somebody sort of zooming in on the average and say, we know there are 12,000, because you don't know. So there I take issue the, with the, the problem is that <laughs> The problem being here is that they haven't made an effort to find out the actual number. That is what they've just said that they will do. That may so be the, thing isn't that that may be the thing isn't that the, per the people who have reported this way are ridiculous. The fact is that they haven't tried to find the real number. And then, just, just to Issa, uh, I think the triangulation, and you'd be very interested to see a report on our web pages, which is called Wartime Sexual Violence, Challenges and Opportunities for Data Collection, where we actually look into uh, how to deal with a number of these bias issues, and not the least where we report on how it is that we have checked out various sources of data and compared them in order to try to reveal where the biases uh, lie. And then the question from the gentleman of Pakistani origin uh, at the back is an interesting one. And one of the more interesting articles I've read recently is a lead article in the New York Times. It was Friday, uh, a week and a half ago, on sexual harassment in the US Army. And I'm not going to quote the figures for you because the week and a half ago, and I can't remember them precisely, but you'd certainly be shocked to see not only uh, the precision, but the level of sexual harassment that you have in the US Army. And let me add about that to say the extent to which those cases have not been investigated and that those women have not received justice. So, you know, no one in this, in, in this world is free of, of those, you know, those allegations. No one is better than anybody else in this game, unfortunately. But nobody has better figures. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure I'd agree with that with the US because there was also very recently data published from the CDC where they have saying that most of the statistics in the US have far too big a bias. So that they, even though they have been saying they've got good data, actually, there, there, there are concerns about how it's been collected and interpreted. So. I love this sort of organic development. But we have two more questions. And I haven't been very good at, at keeping time, but I promise you so you don't start trickling out. We will finish by three, so you will have 30 minutes break before the next session. Okay. But there's one question here, and there was one other. Oh, two others. Be very brief, please. Okay. I'll try, though it's quite hard. Uh, my name is Line Trasselt. Um, I'm from the International uh, Forum of the Norwegian Labour Party. Um, I could have asked, a trillion questions, and uh, but I've tried to limit it. Uh, one of them was um, that the first two presenters talked about specifically sexual violence and rape in conflict. But so my first question is, what do we do with countries that are in, not in conflict, but where there's a great culture uh, where rape and sexual violence is sort of accepted? Um, again, I assume that you were from South Africa, Liesl, because I, I lived there last year. And that's, as we know, one of the countries with the, one of the statistics are saying that there's a higher uh, chance for a woman to get raped than to learn how to read. Which is an absurd statistic. I guess it is. We have extremely is, high but, levels of literacy in South Africa. And I think that's but the kind of statistic please that let me, me please insane. Let me finish. Uh, <laughs> Most, most of my, I had a lot of friends down there and most of them have been raped or been abused. Um, that was my first question. Then secondly, uh, there's a question of, I'm wondering if 
all kinds of rape uh, are being captured by statistics in other countries. For instance, we have this example in Morocco now with this young girl, 16 year old, who committed suicide uh, because she was raped and then forced to marry her husband, uh, marry the rapist. And what I wanted to highlight is that in Morocco, the law that defines rape does only include penetration, does not include men, and if you married, you by definition cannot be raped. So those were my questions, thank you. I have two more. Mahmoud, I know, will always be very, very brief. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Amiri Mogad. I'm from Iran, Human Rights. I think one of the, um, well, I have been following many of the reports by both Amnesty and uh, uh, Human Rights Watch and uh, some of the academic, like uh, Prio. Um, they are often very good, but the problem is uh, under-reporting. That's the major issue. And I think maybe the reason is that uh, these are uh, mainly Western institutions, right, trying to report uh, human rights violations in areas where they are not present. I mean, in, when it comes to Iran, it's pretty good because you manage to recruit you know, activists who uh, do have connections. But when I was looking at uh, uh, your list um, of those who have been working on uh, you know, uh, violence against women in uh, Congo, and there are no local people. And I think that's, that might be one, uh, a major issue that, I mean, if we think strategically, probably we need to recruit people from all over the world. Because for us, it may, uh, seem like a mess, you know, in Africa, so many countries, and you know, where are the things? But maybe for somebody who is from there, it doesn't look that, uh, you know, confusing, and, uh, and probably it's something we need to do. Thank, thank you, and this is now <laughs> the final question of this session. My name is Sunni. Uh, I work as journal, free journal, as a freelance journalist based in Christian Sun. Uh, most, of, most of your Robertus are as like uh, uh, concerning in African content, but African people they accuse you reporting like false reports or baseless reports or untrue uh, reports, information, something like that. And because you are creating, uh, you are one of whether uh, human right or Amnesty International, you are creating one of the problem in the African countries. What is going on? So, what is, what is your feeling about that? Uh, what is coming people in Africa? Because they're accusing you are telling uh, something like baseless information. And sometimes they said like uh, you give some credit Americans or other Western countries because you have benefit uh, differ differences uh, between African countries and the big like uh, American countries, American country or the Western country or something like that one. That's my question. Thank you. Um, will you go on the first? Um, yes, minutes? to yeah. say we obviously have talked about sexual violence and conflict because that's what the panel is about and that's what the theme of the conference has been about. But, you know, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty both investigate violence against women across the world. I mean, it is one of our core priorities. We have recently investigated domestic violence in Turkey. We have a report that is not quite complete looking at the failure of protection systems in Belgium to protect migrant women. So, I mean, I think we've just really foregrounded the work on sexual violence in conflict because of the theme of the conference. Um, a statistic I once heard, which coming from Africa, and let me speak as an African and not somebody who is from the West, that I found very interesting and, and believed for a long time was that apparently if you lived in New York, as a white woman, you had a better chance of being killed by terrorists than getting married. Another clearly ridiculous statistic. And I think when we start saying things like women in South Africa have a better chance of being raped than getting an education, it really undermines the discussion because firstly, that's not correct. And secondly, I think it kind of, it plays into a, a very racist stereotype as far as I'm concerned about kind of what goes on in African countries. And so two things to say about South Africa. One, it has very high levels of violence against women. Two, it has done an enormous amount to increase access to education for girls over the last 10 years. And in fact, you have gender parity both in secondary school and in primary school education. 
No, I mean, you should criticize South Africa, but what I'm saying is that I think we have to be clear about, because it's not an example, because it's simply no factual basis. So I think what we need to do is to be clear about what the question is. If you're saying to me, are there high levels and has the government responded, I will say yes and no. But if you're saying to me, is there a comparison between the number of girls who go to school and the number of women who get raped, then I'm again going to say no, and, and that's really not a good way to access the discussion. Well, again, I'm not sure whether I would agree with you whether sexual violence is accepted, because I don't accept it, and the vast majority of my friends and colleagues and, and acquaintances don't accept it. And I think, again, sort of the pathologizing of African sexuality and around whether it is acceptable is a very problematic way to look at it. And I think you also have to look at how violence emanated, you have to look at where it comes from, and then you have to look at responses. So I don't buy the argument that sexual violence is acceptable because I don't accept it. And I don't know anybody in South Africa who does accept it. I think, you know, again, I have been asked whether, do we have high levels of rape in the DRC because men in the DRC accept it? I think that's an offensive argument, quite frankly. Um, Plenty of good questions. Uh, I was in New York a week and a half ago and uh, attended a presentation of a uh, Department of Political Affairs report on how to deal with, um, how to deal with sexual violence in uh, the context of mediation and negotiations. And they handed out a button which had the text, Stop Rape in War. And just after that, I met with a lawyer friend of mine, and he looks at this, and he said, what does it mean? Shouldn't we stop rape outside the war? <laughs> Look, it's exactly your point. Of course we should stop rape in war. That's not an argument against studying the interaction between war and rape, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that rape is a very, very serious crime overall. I think many of these questions, again, go to the need for better data, more meticulous reporting. I think, Mahmoud, your question on... Uh, on um, how it is uh, that we need l locals involved in the reporting is not necessarily only a question about a possible tension between international and local capacities. I think more importantly, in fact, it is a question about f a fine-grained presence that can actually pick up and document precisely what it is that goes on in the ground in every single instance of the serious crime. That's, that's really what we need. So I'm not saying it's necessarily either or, it's both of those dimensions, but I think that the, the ability to get fine-grained data to, to local presence is as important as anything uh, else. And then on the presence of international agencies, Sumil, was it? Um, I'm not sure what to say about that. I think create the creating uh, civil societies which are dominated by international actors is always quite problematic. It's very, very problematic, and I think we are often in the so-called consensus about how we deal with conflict and peace blind to local capacities, and we simply need to get better at it. And I hope we could have another seminar on that, because it's a huge and it's an important Topic. I'm not saying that to belittle the effort of Amnesty International Human Rights Watch or anybody else, because I think they do tremendously important work, not only because we draw on their data, far beyond that, <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean I disagree with everything you said. There is a core there which I think is tremendously important, and we need to get better. And since I am the moderator and get the last word, <laughs> I'll just <laughs> echo that by saying that both what Mahmoud said and, and what you said is something that is really of concern to us and is actually, as we speak, uh, changing our organizations. We are pushing our people much closer to the field, as we like to say. And we are recruiting much more people working in, coming from the places that we are trying to document human rights violations. Some places we can't because they would get killed, like in Iran. Uh, other places we can, and we're certainly pushing in that direction. So these are not foreign. We won't sort of go into the defensive and say, no, we're perfect. Uh, we know. But on the other hand, uh, I would say that if you 
um, if you claim that we are enemies of the African people, you are also speaking the language of not so nice people because there are also people who believe that we are more friendly than unfriendly, even though I am very white and very far from an African. Um, having said that, I would like to thank you all for your... It's, I think it's the first debate almost I've been to where we just sort of handed it over to the floor and they just ran with it. It's all no, normally sort of a long process of warming up up here. So you've been great participants, probably because you've been listening to so many people today that you've wanted to speak. Uh, thank you so much. There is now, well, you have 28 minutes break until the next session. Thank you. And thank you to the panelists, of course, the most important people. I'm really sorry.